Micah was about two or three years old, he was sitting here at the kitchen table in his high chair. Now this high chair is like an antique high chair. We were eating like tacos or nachos or something. And all of a sudden we saw Micah kind of have this weird expression and somehow like a, a nacho chip had gotten lodged in his throat. And I, I sat down next to him to just make sure he's gonna be okay and his face started to turn blue. And when I looked at him in the eyes, his eyes got huge and they had this look of terror, the look of, of death, of fear that I had never seen before. And I pulled him out of the seat and, and I lay him on my forearm with his chest right there. And I start wailing on his back, bang, bang, Bang! The banging dislodges this thing that's stuck in his throat and he coughs it up. And before he gets a chance to get a breath in, he just starts puking everywhere. He's like, puke is coming like longer and faster and harder than I've ever seen a kid. Like everything that's in his stomach just goes everywhere. And then that moment that every parent wants to hear, the deep intake of breath. <gasps> oh man. I handed him to his mother, who takes him back to the bathroom, gets him all cleaned up. I looked down at myself. I've got puke all over me. And while I had stayed calm through the whole thing, once we were through it, I just fell apart. I absolutely fell apart. Now I tell that story to illustrate this verse that Paul, the first missionary of the church and the author of many of the books of the Bible says in Colossians, for God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. Now what's really interesting about what Paul says here is that God has rescued us. He doesn't say God will rescue us like it's in the future. He says, no, it's already happened. The rescue mission of Jesus has already happened. The Greek word here is ryome, which means to draw to oneself to rescue from destruction, which makes me think not just of that moment that I had with Micah here at this table in his high chair, but this video that I saw, it was an absolutely crazy video of this mom with super quick reaction. Here, watch it with me. The kid does what all little kids do, like while she's waiting at the door, she goes over, and then all of a sudden she bends down, oh my, ah, whoa. That is absolutely insane. That mom saved that child from destruction, from a kingdom of darkness. God is like that mom who saves us from a kingdom of destruction. So here's a question I have for you. When was a time that either you were rescued from or you rescued someone from certain destruction? Let's talk about that. We've all got crazy stories, just like my story with Micah or that mom's story with that little child. Thank you, God, for being saved from certain destruction, rescued from certain destruction. Now, Paul goes on in this passage to talk about not just what we were rescued from, but what we were rescued for. Listen to what else he says. For God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. We're not just saved from something, we're saved to something, the kingdom of the Son. And once you're in the kingdom, now it's just a matter of apprenticeship. It's like discipleship. How, how do you live in this kingdom? What's the culture of this kingdom? And Paul describes right off the bat what the culture of this kingdom is. He says, Jesus purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. One of the first things that Paul says about this kingdom and the culture of this kingdom that you got to apprentice to is that it is a kingdom of forgiveness. And that has both a vertical component and a horizontal component. I mean, there's the forgiveness of God for us and our debts and sins and brokenness. And then there's the horizontal forgiveness of us forgiving the things that people have done to harm us who are around us. Those two things, like the vertical and the horizontal, they go hand in hand. They go together. Whenever we talk about forgiveness as a church, I feel like I got to put some disclaimers on it. And, and that's because the church has really abused this idea of forgiveness, I think, in many ways. So here's four disclaimers about, about forgiveness as we get into this message today. Here's the first one. Forgiveness does not mean staying in an unsafe situation. 
It doesn't mean that if you forgive somebody, you need to stay there where it's unsafe. No, go find a safe place. The second thing that forgiveness does not mean is reinstating immediate trust. You can forgive somebody, but trust often has to be rebuilt, depending especially on how bad the harm was. Now, the third thing that forgiveness does not mean is releasing an expectation of repair. Now, you might release that expectation of forgiveness, but not necessarily. If somebody hits your car and you forgive them for the stupid thing they did, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to say, well, you don't also have to fix my car. And the fourth thing that forgiveness does not mean is forgetting it ever happened. Forgiveness is not amnesia, friends. <laughs> We don't just erase like big parts of our life, parts of our story when we forgive people. No, we, we still remember them. In fact, you may be wondering, well, what is forgiveness then? Here's, here's my favorite definition of forgiveness that I've come across. Forgiveness means actively working toward remembering differently. Now this remembering differently, I mean, this is a process for most of us. It's not something often that happens like immediately. But occasionally it does. Sometimes it happens really quickly, like really fast. But depending on the amount of harm that was done, sometimes this forgiveness is a process that goes really slowly over an entire lifetime. Now I want to show you something in the garage to make this whole point. Hey, come out in the garage with me. Hey, uh, come on over here. I want, I want to show you my childhood bike. I mean, this is this, this right here. This is my orange predator bike that my, my dad bought me this thing. One day when I was in sixth grade, I left this bike on the porch of our townhouse and the next morning it was gone. I was heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken. My dad got really worked up about this. He put out like these flyers and a $200 reward, $200 reward for a tip to lead back to, to finding this bike. I mean, you already know how the story ends, right? Because here's the bike. And we plaster the whole neighborhood with these flyers, like all the stores, everything. And like a day later, we get a tip. A teenage guy had seen it and stole it and was trying to hide it. And we got it back. Nobody asked me at the time that my bike was stolen if I was willing to forgive this guy. But as I think back on it now, like if you had asked me, I don't think I would have been willing to forgive him in sixth grade. I mean, he stole the thing that was like one of my, if not my, my most prized possession. Now I look back on it and I remember the whole thing differently. I, in fact, it feels to me like it was like this big, huge family adventure that the whole neighborhood got involved with. And we eventually, well, we, we found the bike. And as I've grown older, I've, and been involved as a pastor, I've grown to like nuance who people are and learn that, you know, hurt people hurt people. This young man probably was hurt in some way. And in the process, he was hurting me and my family and stealing my bike. But the whole point of this message isn't really about the bike. It's that I remember the whole thing differently than I did at the time. I've forgiven this guy. I mean, completely. I have no ill will towards him at all. That's the magic of forgiveness. We remember differently. And sometimes that happens really quickly. Sometimes it happens slowly as a process. Hey, I got another question for you. When was a time that you had a pain that you now remember differently? Let's talk about that. I think we all have painful experiences in our past that we now can remember differently. And what I wanna talk about today is how we get to that point. What's the process? And there's two things that I wanna to explore today. The first is the perspective that releases forgiveness, and the second is the power unleashed through forgiveness. Let's talk about that perspective first. Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, comes to him and asks this question, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Now. Th Think for a moment about what's the backstory for Peter asking this question. I mean, somebody has hurt Peter uh, over and over and over again. And so Peter's wanting to know, like, you know, how many times do I have to forgive this jerk? 
And Jesus answers with not a direct like number of times, but he answers with a story, a parable. And it's sometimes called the parable of the unmerciful servant. Watch and listen to this parable. Let me tell you a story. There was a time when Jesus was speaking to the apostle Peter and he told him this story. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since the man couldn't repay the debt, the servant's master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold in order to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. The servant's master took pity upon him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he saw one of his fellow servants that owed him 100 denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. The servant fell on his knees, began to beg him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused, and instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison so that he could pay back all that he owed. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. They went to their master and told him everything. Then the master called in the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. So why couldn't you show mercy to your fellow servant just as I have shown mercy to you? In anger, the master turns him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay all that he owed. I love the way that she tells that story. It's absolutely amazing. Of course, the original story of Jesus is an amazing story too. And let's just get the basics down, okay? First of all, who's the king? The king is God, right? And who's the servant? Well, the servant is me and the servant is you. We're the servants. And then there's the money, right? That, that's where like all the depth of the story is. It's actually in the currency. The servant owes the king 10,000 talents. I mean, that's a lot of money. We're going to dive into just how much in a second. But the servant has got some other poor guy who owes him just like a hundred denarii and he's unwilling to forgive him while the king forgives the servant of this 10,000 talents. One denarius equals one day's wage and one talent equals 6,000 denarii. That's like 6,000 days of work. For just one talent, it's 16 and a half years worth of work. Now, according to the 2020 census, the median daily wage of somebody in the United States is 130 bucks, 130 bucks. So for those of you who wanna know how the math works, here's how it works. The median income in the United States is $41,535. Now take that 41,535 and divide it by 52 for the you know, number of weeks in the year, and you get almost $800 uh, a week. Now, let's assume for a moment that you get a day off in a week, so you only work six out of seven days. So $800 roughly divided by six is 130 bucks a day. That's how you get $130 a day for the median income of the average family in the United States. So one denarius is one day's worth of work. That's 130 bucks. And one talent is 6,000 denarii. So $780,000, almost a million bucks. One million dollars. But he doesn't just owe one talent, he owes 10,000 talents, 10,000 talents. So 10,000 times 780,000 is, what is it? $7.8 billion. I mean, that's almost $8 billion. Do you have any idea how much $8 billion? I mean, it's hard to wrap our mind around that. Here's what $8 billion stacked in $100 bills looks like. Now this is a crazy amount of money. I mean, there's absolutely no way that this servant could ever pay back this king. There's no way that if we have this same debt with God that we could ever pay it back. And what's absolutely humorous about this story is the servant says to the king, be patient with me. <laughs> be patient. 
as if the average United States household could ever pay back at $8 billion. I mean, you're talking about 16.5 years worth of work for one talent. That's 16.5 times 10,000, whatever that number is. That's a crazy amount of number. I mean, you would have to be exceedingly, abundantly overflowing with grace to forgive that sort of debt. And thankfully, as Jesus tells the story, that's exactly what the king is like. That's exactly the posture of God towards us to forgive this astronomical amount. Now, usually in this story, when you're talking about this money and the currency, that's where we stop is how much we owe to God. But let's take a moment. Let's focus on what this other poor dude owes to the unmerciful servant. Now, he owes him 100 denarii. And remember, one denarii is 130 bucks. So 100 times 130 is what? $13,000. That, that's how much it is. This poor guy owes... Now, that's a lot of money, right? $13,000. Have you ever held $13,000 in your hand? Actually, I have. We used to have a guy who rented first a room in our house in Petoskey, and then he rented uh, the whole house from us while we were in seminary. And he got behind a couple months in his rent, and... Uh, his name is Alex, and Alex was a Ukrainian-Russian immigrant to the United States, and so he had all of these Russian imperial pendants, these antique Russian imperial pendants. And one day when I was there, he said, hey, would you help me sell these on the internet? You, you know a lot more. Alex was quite a bit older, not very internet savvy, and he's like, would you help me sell these, and that'll pay back the back rent, and then some, I mean a lot more. Eventually, I ended up finding a Russian antique dealer in Chicago. So Alex paid me to go to Chicago to sell these Russian imperial pendants to this antique Russian dealer in Chicago. And I decided to make like a whole adventure of it. And I brought my son Micah at the time. I think he was maybe like three or four. Like, And we took the train there and we had just an awesome time in Chicago. And eventually we met this guy at the Wind Trust Bank right off of Lincoln Park. We meet him at this really fancy bank in this really fancy lobby. And I go up to the guy and I say, hey, I'm about to do a business deal with this Russian guy. I can't even remember his name now. It's like Vladimir or something. And, and as I'm talking to the info desk, the guy says, is it him? And I turn around. This was the most stereotypical Russian antique dealer guy walked in, blinged out. We get into this circular elevator and we go down into the basement vault. And this is where the pictures stop because you don't take pictures in the elevator in this vault. So he pulls out his like monocle, you know, like it's like this jeweler's monocle. And he examines each one of these and he looks up at some point with a very grave expression and he says, uh, I cannot give you $15,000 for these. And I'm like, oh, gee. He says, this one has a crack. And he gives me his monocle and I look at him and yeah, there's a crack in there. And he's like, well, how much can you give me for him? And he says, $13,000. Boom, sold. So he gives me 13,000 bucks. I got $13,000 in cash and in my hand in Chicago. And I took a train to get there with my three-year-old. And I'm like, well, I don't want to, get robbed or lose it. I got to open an account and I open an account and I deposit that $13,000 right there in the Wind Trust Bank at Lincoln Park. I need to take a picture of this money because I've never even held this much money in my hand. And so I, I took a picture and here. So if you ever wonder what $13,000 looks like, here's what it looks like. That's a lot of money. That's, that's a lot of money. And here, here's a question I have for you. What's the most amount of cash you've ever held in your hand? Let's talk about that. All right, some of you have held a lot of cash in your hands. Some of you barely held any cash in your hands. The most I've held is $13,000. And here's the point of that story. I mean, it's kind of a crazy story, but here's the whole point of it. If I had taken that $13,000 out into Chicago and I had lost it and had had to recover that in debt to Alex, pay him back his $13,000, I don't think I could have done it. That's a lot of money. This is the thing about Jesus' story is that this $13,000, that represents that this poor guy who owes the servant that, he's done something really bad. Like somebody's done something really bad to you. $13,000 isn't something to just wink at. I mean, most of us, I, I couldn't absorb that sort of debt and pay it back if I lost it. That's the whole point of the story is that, that 
Jesus is saying, listen, somebody's done you something really bad. So you can either focus on, let's say, like the $13,000 here that somebody owes you. And, and if you focus on that, it's a lot of money. Or you can focus on the $8 billion that you owe God. And, and all of a sudden, when you look at that, like, which one are, which one are you going to stare at? Which one are you going to focus on? And if you focus on this, 13, that, that looks like a lot of money. But if you focus over here in this $8 billion, this is this is the perspective that unleashes forgiveness. Which one are you going to focus on? And, and if I was the evil side of creation, I'd try to get you to focus over here rather than over here. Jesus sets this whole thing up. This is, this is the perspective that unleashes forgiveness. But there's also a power that's unleashed through forgiveness. And I took some time to scour the internet to try to find like a story about the power of forgiveness and how it's unleashed in somebody's life. And I found this absolutely beautiful story of a, well, his name's Mike, and he was an ex-neo-Nazi, white supremacist, and he ended up with this black probation officer, female probation officer, whose name is Tiffany. And they end up in this really unlikely friendship. And what I love about this story of forgiveness is Tiffany is a strong woman. I mean, she's his probation officer. She has to hold him to the repair, to the things that he has done in the past. And yet, their friendship ends up in a kind of space of love and forgiveness. Now, you can go watch the whole video online, but here's um, about six minutes of it, okay? So sit back, get comfortable if you're not already. And what I want you to do is I want you to watch for the power of transformation in forgiveness. Let me ask you, I wanna ask you a serious question, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Why did you believe in me so much? Why did you keep coming back? Why did you want to help me to change? That's not your job. That wasn't your job. It is You're, my job. That's you, why I do my job. Your job is to make sure I'm abiding by all the laws and not messing up, committing crimes, and doing my obligations. But you put forth you put forth more of an effort than anybody I've had in my life that actually tried to help me. Why? Coming into my house, telling me to get rid of things that I, <laughs> I believed in. Mm -hmm. Who the heck are you to tell me to do this? Why did I listen to you? I asked you to do it. I wanted you to be a better person. And that's why I do my job. But if you would have seen me a year later, I would have spit on you. I don't understand why you took this time. And you encouraged me to change my life mm -hmm. when other peers of my people didn't. Probation officers, parole officers, nobody wanted to help me. Why did you? Why did you, why was I your project? You weren't my project. No, but it seemed like that because you're there every step of the freaking way wanted me to continue being better and better. And you pushed me, you strive. Let's get down all these racist things. Let's get down the flags. Let's get down Hitler. Why don't we put up smiley faces? One of the things we talk about all the time, and it makes me laugh, take down all that negative stuff and start putting up positive stuff. So when you go to bed, you have happy thoughts. And when you wake up, you're gonna see the smiley faces and you're gonna have a positive day. You didn't have to do that. Like I said, I'm a number. I could have been right back, but you made a project. I wouldn't be a good father. I wouldn't have been a good husband. I wouldn't be a man that I am today if it wasn't for your stubbornness. You're willing to push me. I don't get it, but I'm very thankful that day you came to my gate. You opened my eyes to a lot of things. You let me know there is a lot of beauty in this world beyond color, beyond anything. You know, because you showed me more love than I got from my own race, my own culture. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've ever told you, but I, I love you. You've helped me. You've changed me. The things I've did in my past, the people I've hurt. That's in the past, Michael, you can't. Listen, listen to me for a second. The children and adults that I've hurt, 
back when I was a child and as an adult. How can somebody love me for that? How can somebody respect me and accept me for the things I've did? That's why I've had all that hate in me. Because who would want me? God. I Man still... upstairs, you have to believe God has had some some strong power force. I don't know if it's me that had to come into your life to break down those walls, to bring love into your heart. But that's what it is. I honestly believe that. Two years ago, I would have told you you're a liar. But since I've had time to do things and seeing and being blessed with all the people I've been talking to and meeting, I'm a firm believer of that now. It's just with everything I've been through, I'm actually being at peace with myself. I'm feeling good with myself. And I hate to say it, I got invited to church when my kids were out there. And I felt comfortable and relaxed when I went there. I felt at peace. These last five years, my sense of purpose and faith and with the Lord has grown tremendously. And it's hard for me to understand, fathom, why do I have my clients, not just Michael, but I have a lot of my clients telling me, Tiffany, without you, I wouldn't be where I am. And that's hard for me. I don't understand that. What, what have I done? But I have the strong belief that the Lord has is using me as a host for him. Michael, I'm going to tell you how the Lord feels about you. He sees you as, or he saw you as a young, a young boy. And he's seen you grow into a man. He wants you to spread his word of love, acceptance, forgiveness. And you question how you can be forgiven. He forgives no matter how bad our sins are. You have to forgive yourself. I forgive you. such a powerful story about the transformation of forgiveness. I, I want to take a moment and let's just talk about it. Where did you see the power of transformation in the forgiveness on display between Mike and Tiffany? Let's take some time to talk about it. While I was working on this message, as is almost always whenever I'm talking about forgiveness, my own situation of forgiveness came up. And as is the case with forgiveness as an adult compared to as a kid when somebody steals your bike, it's way more complex, way more challenging. Hey, uh, note to self, um, don't be a preacher if you don't want to deal with the junk in your trunk. God always seems to bring up those moments of forgiveness as I am preaching about it. And you're probably there as well today. Somebody has done some harm to you, $13,000 worth or 20 or 50 or $8 billion worth of harm to you. Today you're sitting here and saying, there's no way I can do this, Tom. There's no way I will ever remember this differently. And I think you're right. I think it takes the power of God's grace in our life to be able to forgive in this way. So here's what I want to do. I want to, want to end this message today praying for you and, and praying for myself as well, that we would live into this perspective that unleashes 
forgiveness and that we would experience the power in forgiveness. So will you let me pray for you? Take a moment and just put your hands um, in your lap, palms up, and ready to receive the grace of God for that moment of forgiveness for today, for this moment. God, the person in my mind has hurt me. Hurt me maybe more than anybody else has ever hurt me. And I cannot imagine ever being able to laugh or remember differently this pain. I need your help. I need your grace. God, give me the perspective of your forgiveness for me and give me the grace of unleashing the power of forgiveness in my life and the lives of those around me. God, I ask this in the name of Jesus, for me, for you, and the power of God's Spirit. And all who agreed said, Amen.